high strangeness in the village of Rillington. On Rillington The village of Rillington is located on the outskirts of the British Midland city of Derby, and at the foot of the enduring landmark, the abandoned chimneys of Smith and Courtney, the hamlet enjoys the peace and tranquility offered by expansive countryside, deep forests, and the River Trent. In addition to an award-winning butcher, a modest general store, and Mrs. Brown's tea rooms off Brook End, the village boasts a thriving school, admission to which is regularly granted to the brilliant and the gifted nationwide. The jewel of Rillington, though, is the sixteenth-century public house, the Mount Pleasant Inn, in which patrons enjoy renowned British hospitality, inexpensive food and drink, and outstanding vistas overlooking wild woodland and sprawling fields. Visitors find their time well spent in this quintessential historic settlement. One, The Wish The strangeness in Rillington began with a shooting star and a wish. Some wishes are inoffensive, innocent, some are indecent. In a world of misconstrued intentions, we must be firm in our convictions, and wary of others. But what of children? How are we to assess such outwardly incorruptible minds? Nigel and Philip Carroll were nine and seven years old, respectively. The brothers lived in lively cottage on Brook End, with their parents, Stephen and Susan. The clear, crimson sky overhead threatened a bitterly cold night, eliminating the possibility of a white Christmas. The younger sibling, Philip, was excited. As was their parental duty, Stephen and Susan had perpetuated the Christmas myth, and as such, the seven-year-old was eagerly awaiting the arrival of the bearded man in red. As he gazed up at the scarlet ceiling above the village, it appeared, to his youthful perception, that the canvas of crimson was a stage set for Father Christmas himself. Nigel, on the other hand, gazed upon the fiery sky wantonly. Two years his brother's senior, he felt as though he had fallen out of favour with his parents, felt too keenly that his younger sibling had stolen the limelight. The nine-year-old focused on the shifting colours of the sunset, and studied the minute objects he observed there, moving in contrast to the faint remnants of wispy clouds. His dark eyes were crossed, an expression of the hatred he felt for his perfect, butter-wouldn't-melt brother. And then he saw it, little more than a dot in the sky, falling to earth. A shooting star, Nigel mumbled, and in that moment of comprehension he uttered the wish the words he'd wanted to voice for many years, the magical combination of syllables that would free him of his burden, free him of Philip, that insufferable thorn in his side. Apparently, Philip had seen the shooting star too, and was jumping up and down excitedly, pointing and shouting, "'Shooting star! Shooting star!' Stephen Carroll, nursing a glass of scotch, his second of the evening, quickly approached the window, and watched as the shooting star descended overhead. Framed by the crimson inferno that was the early evening sky, the star appeared to expand ever so slightly, before dipping out of view amongst the dense canopy that bordered Lively Cottage. Stephen, intermittently sipping at the scotch, celebrated the observation with his youngest son, regarding the star as a good luck omen, and a sign of wonderful things to come. This, of course, only served to exacerbate Philip's excitement, and his jealous brother looked on in contempt. But the words had been uttered, and if the star truly was a good luck omen, and a sign of wonderful things to come, then it assuredly had the power to grant wishes, no matter how dark or strange. Nigel gazed at his brother and his mildly intoxicated father, as the last of the fire disappeared from the sky— a black shadow fell upon his face, shrouding the hate-filled expression that crossed it. Somewhere out there, close, he felt, the shooting star had found a home in Rillington, and it had come to fulfil his wish. It would wander from home to home, searching, learning, until all the pieces were in place, and the wish would be fulfilled 
before the stroke of midnight. A grin appeared on Nigel's face as his father left for the Mount Pleasant Inn. Two through the looking glass. It was a curious sky for Christmas Eve, thought amateur astronomer Patrick McCone. The twenty-two-year-old student lived in a modest, semi-detached property on a private housing estate overlooking Brook End. He lived alone with his cat, Custard. Custard was a generously proportioned feline, with a mass of sagging flesh at her belly. But despite her apparent weight problem, Custard was the friendliest of pets. She sat on the back of an old rattan armchair, purring contentedly to herself, as her master, the aforementioned Mr. McCone, erected his telescope and pointed it at the fiery sky above. The last few nights had been cloudy, inadequate for stargazing or gazing of any kind. On such nights, young Patrick had an unhealthy tendency to point the telescope in the direction of his neighbours, usually towards the bedroom window of Tracy Brown, a fellow student who lived across the street. Although this activity pinned him as something of a peeping Tom, it never occurred to him that the object of his desire might not appreciate such an intrusion into her privacy. But it was a clear night, and Tracy was partying with friends in Nottingham. As Custard purred away, providing the only background noise, the eye of Patrick's telescope fixed upon what appeared to be a shooting star. The speck on the crimson ceiling was out of focus, and so the eager observer adjusted the lens accordingly. Whatever it was that was descending over Rillington, it wasn't a shooting star. Custard detected the change in Patrick's body language, and joined him at the window, purring, and rubbing up against his leg in that inimitable way only cats can. He ignored her, intently focused upon the strange, descending object, as it grew larger and larger in front of the lens. It quickly occurred to Mr. McCone that the object was much lower in the sky than he had assumed, and although it didn't appear to be gaining momentum, its course seemed to change intermittently, almost as though the object itself, whatever it was, was in control of its rapid descent. As the crimson sky darkened further, Patrick struggled to discern the subtleties of the object's unusual contours. It occurred to him that the shape the object took was quite familiar. The only reason it appeared unusual at all was that it was falling to earth from the heavens, for the object had a very recognizable shape indeed. It was humanoid. The figure was huddled within itself, in the fetal position. The strange vapour trail at its back little more than a wispy tail. Its face, if it had a face, was hidden amongst the torso and the limbs, curled up tight, possibly in preparation for its impact upon the cold earth of Rillington. Custard was really excited now. Her purring had increased in volume, and the adrenaline pulsing through Patrick's veins was transferred to the cat-like static electricity, and the feline's thick fur stood on end in more than one place. As the comet come life form loomed overhead, the young student felt a wave of panic spread through him, and he pulled away from the telescope much too suddenly, tripping over custard and falling head over heels in a heap on the unkempt shag rug in the centre of the living room. It was with a sense of blunder and surprise that the amateur astronomer caught a final, fleeting glimpse of the descending figure with his naked eye before it disappeared from view behind the tallest of the oaks that formed the perimeter of Swine Glade. Still processing what had been a highly erratic and improbable series of events, Patrick McCone lay in silence on the shag rug, as his faithful companion, Custard, the cat with the swingy underbits, mounted herself on his chest with a sense of accomplishment, like a mountaineer cresting the summit of the tallest peak. What on earth was out there? Whatever it was, it had plunged into Swine Glade, an area the locals had shunned due to a dispute with the local authority regarding ownership. It was, as the name suggests, once home to Brannigan's Piggery, before the old fool wandered off his property in the middle of the night some fifteen years prior, and was never heard from again. Some say old Brannigan lives by the abandoned chimneys of Smith and Courtney, in a dilapidated shack down by the River Trent,
but few folks have the gall to tackle the arduous swamps and quagmires to reach the looming towers. Brushing thoughts of Brannigan's piggery aside, the young student shuddered at the thought of who or what might, right now, be trudging through the old swill and filth of Swine Glade. He needed company, fast. Stuffing custard into her customary carry case, Patrick McCone reached for his wallet and keys. Pulling a sweater over his head and wrapping a scarf about his neck, he strode out into the deep twilight, in the direction of the Mount Pleasant Inn. Three. Can I come in? The terraced houses of High Street are on the small side, but perfectly formed, and although the occasional dissenting voice might have a problem with the traffic noise at 5 p.m. on a weekday, the view over the rear on this particular side of High Street is quite something. Perched atop a slight elevation, overlooking a stream and open countryside, this portion of the street, the even fifties, offers a pleasant view of the alluring and mysterious Swine Glade. But folks observing Swine Glade from the housing estate, or even from the gods on higher Park Street, have been known to think less fondly of Swine Glade, owing to their former associations with the erstwhile David Brannigan, the troublesome former proprietor of the piggery, and its once excessive styes. Needless to say, his disappearance fifteen years ago pleased his neighbours. Fifty-four High Street was home to Veronica Locurto and her six-year-old daughter, Abigail. As twilight faded into evening, Abigail Locurto sat comfortably upon her window sill, gazing out across the fields, with occasional nods in the direction of Swine Glade. She'd seen a shooting star, and had watched excitedly, as the strange object plummeted to earth, disappearing into the depths of the former piggery. Whereas an older, more knowledgeable observer might have expected flames, smoke, and the disturbance of nesting birds and wildlife following such an impact, the six-year-old watched without expectation. And when neither smoke nor birds emerged from the dense canopy, an informed, mature individual would have perhaps wandered out into the old piggery to investigate. For what could that strange object, that wasn't quite a meteorite or debris of any kind, have really been. But Abigail, the six-year-old product of an illicit liaison between a teaching assistant from Leamington Spa and an unemployed drifter from the East Riding of Yorkshire, simply watched with silent incredulity, as a small child emerged from Swine Glade, a child she perceived to be about her age, a girl with pigtails and a pretty pink dress, ascending the sloping hillside in the direction of the house. Your average perceptive adult, to whom the stranger would have appeared to be very out of place indeed, with wisps of vapour emanating from the top of her tiny head, would have rushed out to greet her, quite possibly identifying her as the victim of some sort of accident. To have arisen from the sludge and filth of swine glade, immaculately presented in a shimmering dress, with not a spot of dirt or grime on her, it's difficult to imagine what any sane person would think. But Abigail— she saw a friend, a new friend. As the girl approached, Abigail was taken aback by the girl's resemblance to herself. It was uncanny, so much so, that the likeness triggered her analytical mind, and she was forced to glance at herself in the bedroom mirror, to confirm the fact that the stranger was indeed her mirror image. And as she looked upon her face in the mirror, she heard a tapping at the window. Her peripheral vision showed her instantly who was waiting there, some ten feet in the air. Abigail turned her head slowly, to meet the stranger's gaze. The girl was smiling, and of course, Abigail responded with a smile of her own, but even she knew there was something wrong with that smile. A grown-up would have noticed the lack of facial muscles, the inability to adequately form an expression, a face that was assuredly a mask sitting atop who in the world knows what. Whatever lay beneath the reflection of young Abigail, its understanding of the human smile was lacking. Its eyes were the worst of its features, big, black eyes, empty of life, empty of emotion. Beheld by the girl's gaze, Abigail could only smile, as her mirror image knocked again. This time, 
the girl spoke. Can I come in? she asked. Abigail hesitated. Um, she muttered. Again, the strange girl smiled at her, the smile little more than an attempt to distract the six-year-old from the fact it was floating in mid-air. Or was it? Observers from the brook behind the house, or even spectators from the fields might have seen overly long appendages, stretched inhumanly, supporting a poor imitation of a human being some ten feet above. Closer inspection would reveal striated musculature, indicative of some genetic malformation, imbuing the girl or thing with the ability to alter its form to suit its needs. But Abigail only saw the face, and only heard the words, as she or it once again asked, Can I come in? The six-year-old's fascination was slipping, and was rapidly being replaced by the classic fight-or-flight response. This girl wasn't her familiar, and it certainly wasn't a friend. It wanted to get to her for some reason, and that frightened her. In Abigail's mind, she saw the Play-Doh she and her friends were given at school. Play-Doh was rubbery and pliable. It could be pulled apart, pushed back together, and stretched in any number of ways to replicate objects, even little people with bulbous heads. But, as Abigail's mother would attest, children of that age were rarely capable of producing anything truly realistic or lifelike with the putty, and their creations, if taken out of context, would simply be regarded as weird. Such was the girl at the window, a strange, rubbery imitation of a girl, and Abigail didn't like her one bit. She quickly pulled the curtains closed. One final tap-tap-tap at the window followed and somehow Abigail knew the girl had gone. Slowly, she opened the curtains. The putty girl had disappeared, but just in front of where she had floated, or stood, on the window sill outside, was a small, black box. It was very small indeed, comparable to a Rubik's cube. The six-year-old didn't contemplate the box for very long. In quick succession, she opened the window, gripped the box, and flung it into the garden of Mr. Pike, the elderly gentleman next door. As the box landed on the cold grass, young Abigail's memories of the girl at the window began to fade, and her thoughts turned to the old man. Perhaps the small black box she tossed over the fence would be the only gift he'd receive this year. Four. There's a stranger at the door. On clear days, ramblers delight in exploring the vast and open countryside surrounding Wellington. From the shrubs to the river, there's something for everyone. If you find the lure of dense woodland impossible to resist, then you might wander in the direction of the Wilderswood, to inhale the fresh fragrance of the Sitka spruce, and to catch fleeting glimpses of solitary deer. But, if you favour the sights and smells of cattle, the popular Lord Lever Trail intersects a number of open fields, babbling brooks, and crowded pastures. Some two-thirds of the way into the walk, you'll happen upon Stable Fry, the working farm of Miles and Georgina Scott. Stable Fry is an isolated property by all accounts, located on the periphery of the sprawling Rillington Shrubs, approximately a mile outside of the village accessed by a single-track road. But its outlook is unrivalled, offering uninterrupted views of the village and the lofty landmark, the abandoned chimneys of Smith and Courtney. On the afternoon of Christmas Eve, Miles, as was his custom, was conducting last-minute Christmas shopping in neighbouring Derby, whilst he and Georgina's healthy brood, numbering six, were enjoying the day with their grandparents in picturesque Milton, two villages over. Alone on stable fry, Georgina had tended to the livestock, collected the eggs, and exchanged small talk with a number of walkers, including Lana Dennis and Dan Newman, members of the Rillington Ramblers Club, and a pair of holiday-makers, armed with a hand-drawn map and a muddy, excitable fox terrier. As the crimson sky darkened overhead, Georgina stood in the large country kitchen, gutting a turkey, one of their own gazing out across the surrounding farmland. 
She wasn't normally one for thoughts of a philosophical nature, but as a shooting star passed above, thoughts of cosmic grandeur tickled her faculties, and she felt, momentarily, at one with both her isolation at Stable Fry and her situation in a grand and unknowable universe. Preparations for the Christmas feast, including the cooking of the turkey, the baking of two dozen mince pies, the setting of the table for a group of sixteen, for it was apparent that Miles had invited all and sundry, and of course the all-important placement of Christmas crackers, stuffed full of dice, playing cards, golden hats, and poor recycled jerks. As the sunset turned the deepest of reds, a stage for strange spectacles was set. Georgina felt it in her bones. Once again that peculiar, out-of-character sense of philosophical musing returned to her, and with it she became aware of a presence beyond the confines of her comfortable, if somewhat chaotic, home. There came three knocks at the door. But not the main door at the front of the house. No, the caller tapped at the rear door, the kitchen door. Though ramblers had been known to knock at the door of the Scots from time to time, often out of towners in need of directions, visitors after dark were rare indeed, and the forty-two-year-old farmer had no recollection at all of anybody rap-a-tap tapping at the kitchen door. She was an unflinching woman, and rarely felt anxiety regarding unexpected visitations, though on this occasion there was something about the regularity of the knock that filled her with a sense of hesitancy. It was formal, orderly, like a judge hammering a gavel. Still clutching a silver Christmas cracker, Georgina climbed to her feet, approached the kitchen door, and pulled it open. A figure stood in the gloom outside. Twilight had passed, offering little by way of light. The diffuse glow from the country kitchen failed to illuminate the caller, though Georgina could tell it was a man dressed in unremarkable clothes, grey overcoat and trousers, and dark brogues. The curves and lines that illustrated his face were so plain that she found it almost impossible to commit his semblance to memory. Was he smiling, or was he frowning? Was there an expression there at all? She just couldn't tell. Her analysis preceded her manners, and as a result, the stranger spoke first. "'Hello,' he said, in bland, muted tones. "'Hi,' Georgina returned. "'Can I help you?' "'Yes,' the stranger answered. "'I would consider it very fondly, if you could point me in the direction of the village of Rillington.' The man's syntax was strange, but it was by no means impolite, and so Georgina obliged, gesturing in the direction of the single-track road, insisting that by foot the walk was a leisurely twenty minutes, though he'd have to watch for mud and puddles, as there had been heavy rainfall over the preceding few days. The stranger, apparently grateful, bowed slightly, and retreated, disappearing into the cavernous gloom of Stable Fry's numerous courtyards. Georgina studied the soles of his brogues as he left, and was absolutely certain they were squeaky clean, despite his apparent confusion regarding his whereabouts, lost in the mucky countryside. But it was too dark to know for sure. Perhaps he had some Wellington boots in a backpack somewhere. Unlikely. That odd, philosophical musing reared its head once more, as the lone farmer contemplated that strange shooting star, and her apparent sixth sense with regards to the plain fellow in grey. She felt as though the visit had a purpose beyond her comprehension, and that his happening upon the isolated stable fry was anything but coincidence. His face remained an enigma. She had forgotten it entirely, though somehow she knew it wouldn't be the last time she'd see it. As she resumed her Christmas duties, the wrapping of gifts, the hanging of stockings, the playing of music, and the pouring of brandy, the memory of her encounter with the stranger at the door slipped her mind completely. Five, Breakdown It was no good. The car wasn't going to start. Rashid had been driving some seventeen years, and in that time he'd managed to avoid speeding fines, despite speeding five days a week, parking notices, 
despite his refusal to purchase tickets on more occasions than he could count, and insurance claims against him, despite being responsible for accidental damage on no less than three occasions, but breakdowns he'd never come close. Until now. It seemed his not-so-good deeds had finally caught up with him. There he was, some three or four miles out of Rillington, his car a metal husk on the side of the road. If only he had stopped at the petrol station in the village, but no, he just had to trust the Cooper's estimates regarding his remaining fuel. When it had ever been wrong, it had said fifteen miles, for goodness sake. Fifteen miles should have been enough to get him to Derby, enough to get him home for Christmas. But damn if he hadn't broken down on Christmas Eve, on what was assuredly the most unfrequented road in all of Derbyshire. After he'd ceased his efforts to start the car, he'd watched the beautiful sunset in relative comfort, the residual warmth from the car's engine maintaining a steady eighteen degrees Celsius, in stark contrast to the bitter zero degrees outside. As the last of the day's light descended upon the car, he contemplated the walk back to Rillington. Four miles? At a brisk pace, he could manage that in under an hour, he thought, despite being a little on the rotund side these last few years. But he wasn't even wearing a coat. Of course it had been a good idea to head out without one. Everything was against him. The car radio was receiving nothing but static. As well as being without a coat, he left his mobile phone at home, something he never did. He was always so fastidious in that regard. But this whole Christmas business had thrown him for six. He'd only nipped out for a tree, a simple tree from a simple nursery in Rillington. It was a simple journey and a simple transaction, but somehow he'd managed to mess it up in almost every respect. In the back of his hatchback, with the rear seats down, the six-foot tree looked absolutely ridiculous. But he supposed that if all else failed, he could crawl in there with it for a night of prickly cuddles. Before Rashid had made a decision regarding the cold walk back to the village, he caught a glimpse of something unusual in the rearview mirror. It was a wall of mist, crawling slowly above the hedgerow along the road, growing taller and taller as it neared the boot of the car. It quickly consumed the car, and that wonderful view Rashid had had of the sky overhead was now obscured by a thick cloud of vapour. It surrounded the car entirely, and just when he thought it couldn't get any worse. Only one option remained in the salesman's mind. He'd wait for a passing car. It wouldn't be too difficult to flag one down, he thought, as any passing vehicle would be moving tentatively through the fog. But then he realized that he hadn't seen a single vehicle since the breakdown. Nothing. No bikes or pedestrians, either. Come to think of it, he hadn't seen anything, since that strange shooting star passed overhead. He wound the window down a crack, careful not to allow too much of the residual warmth to escape from the car. He listened intently, but heard nothing. Nothing at all. No running water, though he was sure he'd broken down only a stone's throw from the River Trent. No birdsong. No insects. The distant sound of slow-moving traffic. Entirely absent. In fact, it was almost totally silent, barring the sound of his breathing and— if he listened especially carefully, a low hum emanating from the deepest distance. What was happening, exactly? It just wouldn't do. It was a ridiculous situation, and Rashid wanted to see the back of it. He climbed from the car, shuddering instantly, as he was met with the frosty humidity of the voluminous mist. He quickly closed the car door behind him, adamant in his efforts to retain residual heat. He took a few tentative steps, in the direction of Rillington, which was to the rear of the vehicle, and carried on in that respect, assuring the car was still visible in his peripheral vision. And though he knew the idea of losing the car on what was a linear route was unlikely, something told him the situation was quite extraordinary, and that there was a danger he needed to be aware of. He was also wary of wandering out into the road and being taken unawares by an oncoming vehicle, blind to him in the thickening fog. But, it was the cold that made him retreat. There was no way he could stray any further into that icy mist, especially without a jacket or any sense of direction. And so he retreated hastily, succumbing to wearying shivers. Rashid reached the car and climbed into the driver's seat, 
once again thrusting the key into the ignition and turning it frantically. Still, it was no good. He noticed something in his efforts. Though the car wouldn't start, the battery was still operational, and the dashboard display still fed him the same frustrating statistics, remaining mileage, which still falsely reported fifteen miles, the time, which was still ticking along merrily, presently five fifty-five p.m., and the temperature, which was precisely what had caught his attention. The temperature inside the car was still eighteen degrees Celsius. The vehicle had been stationary for well over an hour. His observation of the sunset was proof of that. So why hadn't the temperature dipped? It was in that moment of contemplation that all manner of unusual, metaphysical concepts arrived in Rashid's mind, which was very uncommon for the matter-of-fact, no-nonsense salesman from Derby. Observing the strange conditions surrounding him, the wall of mist, the overbearing silence, and the constant temperature, Rashid visualized a state of timelessness in which he found himself the lone, inexplicably conscious inhabitant of a single state universe. But the clock on the dashboard display was still ticking over, and so timelessness couldn't be the answer to the quandary. So then, Rashid imagined himself as the sole occupant of a cross-section of the cosmos, a portion separated from the rest of reality, by a process akin to chalk swept from a chalkboard, matter scattered, and temporarily isolated in some new spatial dimension, caught in a state of freefall for an undetermined period of time. Eventually, he considered, the cross-section, or chalk, would land upon the surface, or carpet, of a parallel dimension, not quite home, but uncannily similar. But if Rashid's portion of the cosmos was indeed the chalk in this odd analogy, then how long would he be caught in this state of freefall? A hundred years? A thousand? A million years, with only radio static and an oversized Christmas tree for company? And furthermore, upon finally reaching the surface of the parallel dimension below, how similar would it be to the one he knew? Would his family remember him? Would its inhabitants even recognize him as human? He didn't like those odds. Then it occurred to him that perhaps consciousness permeates all things, space, time, and dimensions, and if so, he might have a choice, a way in which to literally think his way out of the quandary. Two scenarios crossed his mind. One, to persist with the freefall, eventually merging with the parallel dimension below, or two, to return to the chalkboard, along with the Mini Cooper, the Cloud of Mist, and the prickly Christmas tree. As the clock turned six p.m. on the dashboard display, the car's engine spontaneously ignited. The mist dissipated entirely, and in what Rashid considered to be the most telling of changes, the temperature inside the vehicle dipped from eighteen to seventeen degrees Celsius. Wherever he'd been, he didn't care to dwell on it any longer. His metaphysical ponderings departed as he put his foot to the floor. Next year, he'd order a tree online. Six, Nolly of the Crypt. Rillington School is a sprawling expanse of buildings, both modern and traditional, the oldest of which, including the adjoining chapel, dates back to the twelfth century. The chapel itself, St. Patrick's, stands atop the most ancient of the structures, Rillington Crypt. At the bottom of a dimly lit, spiral staircase, the crypt welcomes visitors every day of the week, as the chapel's antique doors are rarely locked. The inhabitants of Rillington aren't afraid to admit to the presence of ghosts in and around St. Patrick's and the older parts of the school. Still to this day, honest pupils report missing articles, particularly items of clothing, often scarves, socks, and gloves. Tutors consistently attribute the thefts to Miss Mary, the apparition of a fourteenth-century bell-ringer's daughter, who severed her wrists in the vaults of Rillington Crypt following the death of her son, a sickly, disfigured boy called Nolly. It is said she held the clergy responsible for the boy's passing, claiming his ailments were exacerbated by a questionable baptism at the hands of a nervous priest. Following Miss Mary's suicide in the dilapidated vaults, the aforementioned priest was found in a similar state, 
the oft-repeated tales of gnawing at his wrists are commonly attributed to Nolly, the shrunken boy with the crooked teeth. And so, if high strangeness is reported in the vaults of the crypt, or in the shadowy passages of the school, then it is either the work of Miss Mary, or little Nolly, or as he is known to the locals, Nolly of the Crypt. The agonized cat-like squealing often heard throughout the empty corridors in winter is Nolly, the thing that lives in the ventilation system, often said to watch lone pupils and tutors in their respective environments, is Nolly. Nolly of the Crypt is everywhere, and everything. As the scarlet sky faded to blackness that Christmas Eve, three pupils, Gary Buckthorn, Bonnie Skelton, and Adriana Alexander, crept onto the school grounds, and headed in the direction of St. Patrick's. Gary, a bright kid but lacking in common sense, had spent the previous evening carving up a spirit board. It was a crude piece of carpentry, but the letters A to Z, and the words yes and no, were legible upon its gaudy surface. Bonnie, the daughter of Gerald Skelton, the town butcher, had been tasked with sourcing a shot-glass, the purpose of which was to serve as a medium, an earthly item the three of them could place their grubby fingers upon, when communication with Mary, or, God forbid, Nolly of the Crypt, was established. Adriana, your archetypal fashionista and all-out daddy's girl, had simply caught wind of Gary and Bonnie's strange plan, and had booked front-row seats to the event. Reaching the chapel, the teenagers entered, and made their way between the silent pews towards the spiral staircase. A dim hue emanated from the depths of Rillington Crypt, and it wasn't in the least bit inviting. Down they went. The school caretaker, a lanky fellow by the name of Christopher Maloney, was doing his rounds that evening, conducting his nightly duties in an efficient and orderly manner. He was particularly attentive this time of year, just before Christmas, as the thought of problems occurring over the festive period, frozen pipes, gas leaks, and power outages, filled him with dread. The school was his life, and he felt a tremendous responsibility for those who walked its corridors and studied in its classrooms. This particular Christmas Eve, Mr. Maloney, a high school dropout himself, heard on the night air what he believed to be activity in the chapel, hushed tones, and giggles. He proceeded in its direction. The three teenagers laughed hysterically, for the ridiculous responses the spirit board offered in answer to their questions were downright comical, and certainly not otherworldly. Then there was a pull on the upturned shot-glass, a sort of yank in an unfavourable direction, off the board. Before the glass shattered upon the cold stone surface of the crypt, Adriana instinctively reached out and caught it. Relief. But also, concern. Gary knew he hadn't forced the glass off the board. And Bonnie knew she hadn't. Adriana wasn't even within arm's reach of the homemade contraption. Gary eyed Bonnie suspiciously, and then Adriana, both of whom returned his glare with unspoken anxiousness and fear. Perhaps this was a game better not played. Perhaps they'd angered Miss Mary. Or Nolly. Master Buckthorn, adjusting his jam-jar glasses, and putting on a brave face, collected the shot-glass from Adriana, and positioned it back on the board. There were no further responses to their queries. The three of them were beginning to feel the chill of the old place. A breeze whistled from the deeper vaults, brushing against the naked flames of the countless prayer candles, raising the hairs on the backs of their necks. Adriana, slowly becoming an unwilling participant in Gary and Bonnie's morbid game, became aware of a shuffling sound, a distant, crawling, or dragging. "'What's that?' she asked of no one in particular. "'What?' Gary returned. "'That sound,' she continued. "'What sound?' The din intensified. The dragging sound was now audible to all. That sound! Adriana bellowed. Bonnie wasn't happy in the least. Neither was Gary, and Adriana was already on her feet. Collecting the spirit board and the shot glass, Gary and Bonnie rose too, as the horrible clamour manifested itself in the corner of the room. <laughs> 
From the shadowy recesses of the deeper vaults, a diminutive figure wrapped in faded scarves crawled into view. It was assuredly youthful, some two or three years of age, dragging itself towards the centre of the crypt with a strange volition. Its legs, trailing behind it, were immobile, and shockingly, there were three of them, hideously withered and deformed, colourless socks adorning each of its three feet. The teenagers were frozen aghast. Bonnie turned white, Gary heaved, but Adriana made for the stone stairs. Her initiative drove the remaining two after her, as well as the misshapen toddler, who, in its haste, was shrieking now, the same salient cry, often heard throughout the myriad classrooms and ventilation ducts of the school. As they ascended the old spiral staircase, each of them shaking violently, they were both shocked and relieved to collide with Mr. Maloney. "'What on earth?' he begged of them, observing their fear and panic. But his question went unanswered, and his will to ask again went with it, as over the shoulders of the tremulous teenagers, Christopher Maloney, with his own eyes, despite the rumour mill and the stories he'd heard since childhood, saw the horrible form of Nolly of the Crypt, its twisted hand clutching devastatingly at the stone steps below, shrieking. With the miscreant pupils in tow, the four of them fled from the chapel, and for the first time in three decades as caretaker, he locked the massive oaken doors behind him, and they fled into the night. Seven. A Gift for Mr. Pike Edmund Pike had been dozing when he heard it. He spent most of his days dozing, so the act in itself wasn't unusual. Old Pikey, as he was known throughout the locale, was an eighty-four-year-old former greengrocer, retired some twelve years. His late wife, Suzanne, had departed a decade earlier, leaving the elderly gentleman alone in Rillington. Old Pikey was without offspring, and without pets, and though his general health was good, chronic loneliness was his most significant ailment, routine, his only friend. Monday morning, he could be found purchasing groceries at Blanche's general store, engaged in the act of small talk, for as long as he could hold Anne-Marie's attention. Tuesday, he'd be chatting to Gerald Skelton, the butcher, procuring for himself a few slices of boiled ham or ox tongue. Wednesday, as sure as eggs is eggs, he'd be sitting comfortably at table seven at Mrs. Brown's tea-room, smiling at other patrons, eager for a beamer in return. Thursday, it was back to Blanche's for milk and bread. And Friday, the cemetery down by St. Patrick's, knelt before the grave of his one and only Suzanne. Weekends consisted of a walk in the fields down by the Trent, or a short bus journey into neighbouring Derby, but his advancing years made it increasingly difficult for him to travel much further than the edge of the village. But this particular evening, this Christmas Eve, when he heard the thunderous crash in the back garden, quite a crash indeed to his sensitive ears, he jolted awake suddenly, and had wandered into the kitchen in a sort of daze, in search of the source of the unwelcome noise. Whatever was out there, its intrusion had triggered the security light. He didn't see it at first, even with his glasses perched precipitously on the end of his heavily reddened, bulbous nose. But after squinting, he noticed a small, black box lying on the well-manicured lawn. Had somebody tossed it over the fence? Quite possibly. But how had such a tiny item made such a racket when it landed on the grass? Perhaps it hadn't. Perhaps it simply bounced off the fence, and his unconscious mind amplified the sound in the world of dream. He supposed it didn't matter. Intrigued, he unbolted the back door, and retrieved the strange object. Upon closer inspection, the small, black box was in fact a tightly wrapped package of some description. The packaging material was a very deep black, extremely unusual for festive gift wrap. It was completely matte. Taking the package inside, old Pikey closed the back door behind him, and bolted it habitually. Identifying the carefully hidden seams under a magnifying glass, the elderly widower proceeded to open the package 
with a blunt butter knife. Within, he discovered a plain wooden box, red in color. A round button was embedded in the front of the box, flush with what was an incredibly smooth, polished surface. Hesitant, he returned to his favorite armchair in the living room, and sat, contemplating the plain box and the round button. If he was honest with himself, his hesitation in pressing the button was owed to the fact that he hadn't felt such a thrill in many years. His life had become so monotonous, so predictable, that the opportunity to savor anticipation such as this was to be exploited to the fullest degree. So he sat in silence for a good, long while, studying the smoothness of the box's six sides, running his frail fingers along each of them in an attempt to locate a point of ingress. But his efforts were futile. The finish was so utterly perfect, so precise, that for all intents and purposes, the box was a solid piece of wood. Only the button contradicted this notion, and the weight, which upon further assessment, suggested that whatever the box might contain, its physical attributes were limited. Eventually, he grew tired of the charade, and chose to press the button. Looking back on what followed, Mr. Pike wished he hadn't pressed it. He wished he'd placed the box on the shelf for all time, allowing for the possibility of dreams and fantasies, in which he guessed at what the mysterious box might contain, new and recurring fulfillment, engaging his imagination on a daily basis. Wonderful, wonderful anticipation! But it was too late for all that. He'd pressed the button, and the flush lid had shot upwards, revealing the smallest of interiors, host to, as he'd thought might be the case, nothing of significance, but a carefully folded piece of paper, with a single phrase printed upon it, in a style of writing that meant very little to him. The note read, Let me in, and I'll grant you a wish. Nobody had knocked upon old Pikey's door in a long time, other than the postman and the occasional door-to-door -door salesman. Nobody had tapped upon his window, other than the window cleaner and those kids a few years back playing knock-a-door run. Nope, nobody had asked to enter old Pikey's place, and that meant there'd be no wishes for him. The package must have been intended for somebody else. The old man frowned, saddened by the whole experience. Suppose you'd better head to bed, he muttered to himself, addressing the only person in the world he knew would be listening. Mr. Pike placed the wooden box on the mantelpiece, and ambled to bed. The small red box disappeared. Eight, in the shadow of Smith and Courtney. The strange creatures came at dusk, in the shadow of the five looming towers. He went about his ritualistic duties, fishing by the river, laying traps in the woods, and lighting a fire in his small but comfortable shack. After watching the descent of a shooting star, an eerie sensation had passed over him, a shiver, as if his ancestral burial grounds had been disturbed. He'd attributed it to the chilly evening air, as was often the case towards the end of the year, but an unusual wall of mist had descended, too, obscuring his familiar surroundings. The dense fog failed to deter him from his tasks, the retrieval of salmon from the river, the acquisition of a squirrel from the woods, and the splitting of firewood to the rear of his shack. Deboning the fish and skinning the squirrel, his supper was cooking well before he heard the encroaching footsteps. He heard a sort of muttering, too, from vocal cords unknown to him, and as the strange creatures neared his homestead, he was forced to abandon his evening meal. He extinguished the fire, and retreated into the protective undergrowth between the lofty towers. The mist clearing somewhat, he caught his first glimpse of the interlopers. There were three of them, each standing in stark contrast to its neighbor. Brightly colored garments were slung about their frames, upon which unfamiliar symbols were emblazoned, totally foreign to him. As he retreated further into the brush, he saw more. The creature in the middle had something upon its tiny head, another garment, it too bearing strange lettering utterly baffling to him. The heads themselves increased his concern. Their skins were mostly bald, 
revealing pale, undernourished flesh, which made him quiver in fear. Pointing with smooth fingers, they whispered amongst themselves in a language he couldn't comprehend, their hideously repellent voices relentlessly assaulting his ears. But this was his territory, and he'd be damned if he didn't defend it from intruders. These strange creatures, whatever they were, had to be driven out. And so he emerged from the thickets and thrust himself forward. Kyle Dots, Joseph Merritt, and their daring friend, Patricia Robinson, slowly approached the towering silhouettes of Smith and Courtney. The old chimneys had stood on the outskirts of Rillington for over seventy years, providing both a dramatic backdrop and a recognizable landmark. Though defunct and abandoned now for some twenty-five years, the chimneys were still of great interest to the locals, particularly the younger generations. Mothers and fathers had passed down stories regarding the chimneys, from urban legends pertaining to the ghosts of dead children haunting the tower's cathedral-like interiors, to cryptozoological rumours surrounding the possible presence of big cats and primates. Excessive flooding along the banks of the River Trent had turned the old Smith and Courtney access road into a formidable quagmire, rendering access by typical means impossible. Local authorities had consistently voted against restoration or conversion of the old chimneys, and as such the access road was of little concern to them. That said, the younger generations, your Kyles, Josephs, and Patricias, for example, were undeterred by the treacherous conditions of the old road, and had spent many an evening searching for potential routes onto the site. The most promising was via a sizable portion of swampland at the edge of the land comprising the expansive Pendrack Estate, this veritable plain led almost directly to the third chimney, beneath which, local legend said, something lived in one of the old storage sheds. And so, the mischievous teenagers decided that the wee hours of Christmas Eve would serve them well, in their efforts to access the old site, and to learn the truth regarding the legend of Old Fuzzy. Patricia's eye had been upon the crimson sky, as the three of them stole through the untamed shrubland in the direction of chimney number three. But shortly after the passing of a shooting star, a veil of mist had descended, obscuring the route ahead. Determined as ever, the three, led by the unrelenting Miss Robinson, moved carefully through the sludge. In the shadow of Smith and Courtney, the three teenagers gazed in awe at the old shed at the base of chimney three. Kyle thought he had heard something move in the bushes beyond, and upon relating the fact, Joseph had suggested a retreat, but Patricia had insisted they at least check out the contents of the shed, to prove or disprove the long-standing legend. The opportunity to explore was quickly lost, as the three of them set eyes upon an approaching figure, a giant of a creature, covered from head to toe in brown fur, hurtling towards them. Assuredly, this was old Fuzzy himself. As the teenagers turned to flee, the monster let out an unearthly screech, a cry of tremendous proportions. Propelled by fear, the teenagers flung themselves back into the mist, back onto the treacherous plain, in the direction of the Pendrack estate. The giant frame of old Fuzzy continued to close in on them, as the youngsters approached the Pendrack manor. Their presence at the rear of the property triggered a series of external security lights, guiding them to safety. But whether the occupants of the grand house would come to their aid, Kyle, Joseph, and Patricia would never know for sure. As the grisly monstrosity lunged forward with its arms outstretched, each of them felt a strange shivering sensation, as if somebody had walked over their graves. Patricia stopped. Something had changed. The fog had dissipated, and the Pendrack Manor had disappeared, along with her faithful companions, Kyle and Joseph. Old Fuzzy was gone, too. Turning, she saw only open fields, towering trees, and the distant, dilapidated shed, sitting in the shadow of the abandoned chimneys of Smith and Courtney. Nine. Turtle Doves at Infinitum. Dylan Pendrack and his wife Sophie 
intent upon a quiet Christmas Eve in their impressive country manor, stood at the rear patio doors, gazing out upon a misty lawn. The couple had heard a scream, and had rushed to the window to investigate. But instead of observing the source of the cry, they'd seen something they could only describe as a phenomenon, a sort of ripple in the mist, a transparency, beyond which only darkness could be observed. Perhaps there was a figure, too, a sort of hairy, gorilla-like figure, something a cryptozoologist might describe as Sasquatch or Yeti. Perhaps not. In an unlikely fashion, the ripple moved in the direction of the house, like the visualization of sound carried across an empty plain. Whatever the strange ripple was, they knew it had struck the house, as immediately following it, a thunderous crack was heard upstairs. Dylan and Sophie Pendrack had purchased their sprawling estate in the late nineties, following the sale of their magic business, Pendrack's World of Illusions Limited. In their formative years, having hailed from the banks of the Tyne in England's northeast, the couple had performed nationwide, Dylan the illusionist, and Sophie the many-time victim of the saw, the water tank, and the vanishing. Latterly, the couple had retired from the stage, focusing instead upon the design and manufacture of stage props and gimmicks. But the noisome flapping on the third floor was far from illusory. The pair climbed the stairs tentatively, and approached the apparent source of the racket, the attic. Opening the creaky door, they ascended the narrow wooden staircase, and stepped into the dusty old chamber. It was with a strange irony that the former magician saw two turtle doves in the rafters, having worked with such birds on countless occasions, filling their sleeves with the delicate creatures, and comfortably stowing them away in oversized hats. Dylan had an especial love for the birds, forever grateful for their unrelenting patience as the unwitting participants in long-forgotten shows. But was it the birds themselves, or their inexplicable point of ingress, that now intrigued the couple so? The attic was windowless, the only point of access being the second-floor door they'd stepped through just moments before. Upon noticing the couple, the doves ceased their flapping, and simply gawped at them, as though gazing upon their kind for the very first time. Sophie opened her mouth to comment, when spontaneously, out of thin air, a third turtle dove appeared next to the other two. This sudden appearance clearly disturbed the other birds, each of which resumed its maniacal flapping, now coupled with feverish squawking. "'What is this?' Dylan piped. "'I don't know,' Sophie replied, quite honestly. "'Could it be a trick?' "'Surely not.' If it was a trick, then its secret was beyond their comprehension. Despite years of experience in both performance and design, neither Dylan nor Sophie Pendrack could imagine the mechanics responsible for the spontaneous manifestation of a living creature. As the three doves settled on a beam in the rafters, a fourth appeared, again causing the other birds to flap and squawk in protest. Then a fifth appeared, and a sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten. The process was exponential. The Pendracks were frozen in place as the spectacle unfolded before them. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. The flapping and squawking was overwhelming now, each of the birds forced to accommodate its neighbor, sending them into a demoniac state of frenzy, as the empty space in the attic slowly yielded to the multiplying doves. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. The Pendrax retreated down the narrow staircase, slamming the attic door behind them as they reached the second-floor landing. The former magicians listened as the cacophony of flapping and squawking continued to increase in volume and ferocity beyond the door. Would there be an end to this phenomenon? What would happen when the attic ran out of space? Dylan and Sophie imagined that was fairly obvious. Blood would be spilled. Hundreds of doves would be crushed, their collective mass forcing the attic door open. The birds would spill forth into the house proper, flapping and squawking. But what wasn't obvious was the speed in which such a scenario would unfold. The couple began to panic, bracing themselves for the turtle doves' inevitable domination of their beautiful home. 
thoughts of prevention flooding their minds, they became aware of a distinct change in the sounds beyond the door. The flapping had all but stopped. The squawking continued, somewhat muted, the sound deadened by the presence of hundreds, if not thousands, of tightly packed turtle doves. But before the old door gave way to the immense pressure behind it, the blood of untold numbers of birds began to ooze from beneath it, through the edges of the frame, and out of the tiny keyhole. The Pendrax stood as still as statues, horrified by the strangeness to which they had been exposed. But something, perhaps the promise of Christmas, was about to put an end to the strangeness. A ripple, much like the one they'd observed in the mist outside, passed before their eyes, and penetrated the now splintering wood of the attic door. In the same instant, the door burst open, and the former magicians briefly glimpsed a mass of meat, bone, and crimson feathers, before the vision disappeared entirely, leaving the attic as it once was, silent, dusty, and filled with the artifacts of a life the Pendrax had said farewell to decades ago. But on the wooden steps of the narrow staircase, something remained. The white, distinctive feather of a turtle dove. 10. A Trip to the Nursery The sun had all but departed from the late afternoon sky, as Jamie Cameron and his seven-year-old son Dale pulled into the gravel car park at Peter's Pines. A December trip to Japan had put the family out of sorts, the three of them, Jamie, his wife, Fiona, and Dale, having returned to the UK that very morning, with additional Christmas shopping to do, not including the variety of weird and wonderful gifts acquired in the Far East, they still had a Christmas tree to purchase. The Camerons never did things by halves, even if that meant succumbing to the onset of nervous exhaustion in a last-ditched attempt to orchestrate the perfect Christmas in a mere eight hours. In a cold sweat, Jamie and Dale climbed from the people carrier and stumbled into the nursery. Peter Roberts, the proprietor of Peter's Pines, waved them on, as he did to all the last-minute customers who seemed to think he had nothing better to do at 4 p.m. on Christmas Eve. But he still had trees to sell, and ever the consummate businessman, he would sell as many as he could. The grove was eerily silent, as the last of the day's scarlet glare seared the tops of the trees. Jamie and his son edged studiously through the nursery, on the lookout for something appropriately sized. Their living room back home, a low-ceilinged, beamed affair, the back portion of a traditional country cottage, could accommodate a tree no larger than six feet in height, which, by the look of things, would be difficult to attain, as old Peter's remaining trees were all in excess of seven feet. It was surprising, in fact, how many trees still remained. But Mr. Roberts was a man of plenty, and whatever remained unsold following Christmas Eve would be sold as mulch in the new year. Ahead of them, between two especially tall trees, young Dale caught a glimpse of a small figure, possibly another child, he thought. He pulled eagerly on his father's scarf, as Jamie, in turn, looked down at the red-headed boy. "'What's up, pal?' he asked, observing a disturbingly large frown upon his son's face. The boy offered no words in response, choosing instead to point in the direction of the two large pines ahead, between which stood the hunched figure. Jamie's eyes fell upon a solitary girl. He wondered if her parents were nearby. With Dale in tow, he approached her cautiously. "'Hello?' Jamie called. But the girl failed to respond. She stood perfectly still, gazing ahead. As the father and son neared her, it occurred to Jamie that something wasn't quite right. Although she was looking in their direction, it appeared she was looking through them, rather than at them. It was very difficult to tell, as the girl's eyes were entirely black. It was impossible to differentiate between pupil and sclera. "'Are you all right?' Jamie continued, feeling a little uncomfortable in her presence. Dale was equally unimpressed, letting his father know by squeezing his hand just a little bit tighter. "'Are you on your own?' Jamie pressed. But the girl continued to gaze in that strange, ethereal manner penetrating both father and son, looking beyond them towards some unknowable horizon. Nearer still, 
Under the illumination of several kerosene lamps, Jamie studied the girl's face. Her skin was unusual, pale, impossibly plain, and entirely without expression, as though her insipidity was intended to draw one's gaze back to her hideous, black eyes. Abandoning all thoughts of a Christmas tree, Jamie clutched Dale's hand tightly, and began to retreat. As they did so, the girl shuffled forward, awkwardly at first, as though her limbs were having difficulty achieving locomotion, like an infant taking its first steps. Oddly, her arms and legs were incredibly stiff, lacking noticeable joints at the elbows and knees. Scooping Dale into his arms, Jamie turned and fled. Behind him, he heard the awkward footfalls of the ambling child, and felt the blackness of those penetrating orbs upon his cold back. Reaching the gravel car park, Mr. Cameron once again nodded in the direction of old Peter, who in turn offered a sort of confused wave, noticing the speed with which they were moving, and the distinct lack of a Christmas tree. Whether or not Mr. Roberts saw the black-eyed girl as she emerged from the grove behind them, is a matter Jamie and Dale hadn't the time to consider. Bundling Dale into the people carrier, Jamie turned, and saw the plain-faced child approaching at an unusually swift pace. Her arms appeared longer than they had initially, whilst conversely, her legs had shrunk, bringing her torso closer to the ground. Apparently, the girl had discovered a more efficient way to progress. Jamie yanked the driver's side door open, and hurled himself inside. Pulling it closed behind him, he immediately triggered the central locking. Dale let out a startled cry, as he came face to face with the strange child at the passenger side door. He recoiled into the arms of his father. The pair simply watched in silent terror, as the black-eyed girl, her face a mask of rubber, stood in complete silence, void-like orbs fixed upon them. Then the creature with the girl's face spoke. Can I come in? It wasn't the first time those words had been uttered that evening. No! Jamie instantly responded, and apparently that was all it took for the being to disappear into thin air, almost as though it had never existed. Dale looked up at his father, exasperated, panting like a frightened animal. Jamie slipped the key into the ignition, started the engine, and put his foot to the floor. The Camerons would go without a real Christmas tree this year. They'd settle for the plastic one in the loft. But their eager departure alerted old Peter, who, upon emerging from the comfort of his dilapidated kiosk, observed something lying upon the rough gravel precisely where the Cameron's people carrier had been. He approached it eagerly. It was a small, black box. A gift? Mr. Roberts, not the type to feel overly sentimental about the loss of a child's Christmas present, quickly unwrapped the strange package. A red box, and a round button. Greedily, he pushed the button and the box slowly opened. But inside, he was disappointed to discover nothing more than a curious wisp of paper bearing the words, Let me in, and I'll grant you a wish. A short while later, as old Peter sat studying the note in his little kiosk, there came a tapping upon the window. A strange voice asked, Can I come in? Eleven. Last Orders at the Mount Pleasant Inn The Van Pelts had owned and operated the Mount Pleasant Inn for over thirty years. Ian and Jeanette were well liked throughout the community, their establishment commonly referred to as the Heart of Rillington. The punters that Christmas Eve comprised a healthy number of locals. Shannon Curtis, the proud owner of Mrs. Brown's Tea Room off Brookend. Big Al Norman, also known as Stack, owing to his larger-than-life frame. Veronica Lo Curto, whose daughter Abigail was at home, cozying up with Granny for the night. Harrison Connor, town councillor and all-round figurehead of the community. Charles Taylor, or Oberon, as his friends called him, an acknowledged pool shark and regular at the pub. Stephen Carroll, the significantly intoxicated father of the boys Philip and Nigel. Young Patrick McCone, his cat Custard purring in her carry-case, Miles and Georgina Scott, spending a quiet evening away from the hectic stable fry, Christopher Maloney, the trembling caretaker, 
with visions of Nolly of the Crypt clouding his mind, the fiery-headed David Creighton, a timid fellow from the edge of the village, and lastly, Robert and Alison Duncan, veteran lecturers at Rillington School. Something had brought them together that evening, a certain inexplicable something. High strangeness, the senior members of the community might have described it. As the landlord, Ian, busied himself with the pouring of white fluff for the ale connoisseurs at the bar, a peculiar stranger arrived at the inn. A fly on the wall might have likened the scene to that often seen on the silver screen. The arrival of the interloper, coming face to face with the locals, their faces coloured with curiosity. And that's precisely how it was that evening. Ian stopped pouring pints, and the locals halted their conversations. Even Custard, safely nestled in the comfort of her carry-case, ceased her incessant purring, her yellow eyes targeting the shadowy figure at the door. The stranger's appearance disturbed the punters, each of them studying him intently, baffled by the lack of defining features upon his plain face. Georgina Scott recognized him immediately, noting the short, cropped hair, the grey overcoat, and the brown, immaculately clean, brogues. Exacerbating the suspense, the stranger proceeded to withdraw a number of white envelopes from the inside pocket of his overcoat. Veronica Locurto eyeballed the man as he leafed through the envelopes. Somehow, she knew one of them had her name on it. But what was it? A Christmas card? She doubted it. Then the stranger spoke. Protracted was my journey this evening, the interloper began, his tone monotonous. I bring tidings. He waved the envelopes in the air, like a defeated soldier waving a white flag. Who are you? Ian Van Pelt asked from behind the bar. I bring tidings, the stranger repeated, selecting the topmost envelope for inspection. Capturing the landlord's gaze, he announced, Ian Van Pelt. Aye, that's me, Ian answered, a little dumbfounded. Jeanette Van Pelt, the man in grey said, continuing to leaf through the envelopes. Shannon Curtis, Alan Norman, Veronica Locurto. The stranger paused, placing five envelopes on the table next to the door. Harrison Connor, Charles Taylor, Stephen Carroll, Patrick McCone. Again, the man paused, adding a further four envelopes to the pile on the table. Miles Scott, Georgina Scott. He looked directly at Georgina as he said her name, recognizing her from their previous encounter at Stable Fry. He acknowledged their prior meeting with a subtle nod. Christopher Maloney, David Creighton, Robert Duncan, Alison Duncan. He placed the remainder of the envelopes on the pile, fifteen in total, one for each person present in the Mount Pleasant Inn. These tidings are of the utmost importance, the grey man continued. For failure to adhere to the words printed upon these letters will result in my return. Again, the stranger paused. Mark my words, if I am to return, you'll see a face worthy of memory. He gestured at the pile of envelopes on the table, inviting all present to collect their letter. As quietly as he'd arrived, the figure retreated, ensuring the door closed behind him. The owners and patrons of the Mount Pleasant Inn blinked, as though released from the grip of some incomprehensible daydream. Ian continued to pour pints at the bar. The punters resumed their chatter. The envelopes remained upon the vacant table-top. All memory of the man in grey had slipped from their thoughts. But the pool-shark, Oberon, who, as fate would have it, had been unable to take his eyes off the stack of envelopes on the table by the door, climbed to his feet. Hesitantly, he collected the letters, and in a quiet manner, distributed them accordingly. One by one, the occupants of the Mount Pleasant Inn opened their envelopes. There was a visible whitening of the flesh. The colour drained so dramatically from the face of the fiery-headed David Creighton that he fell faint, slumping back into his chair momentarily. But nobody rushed to his aid. Nobody even noticed, each consumed by the contents of his or her envelope. What in the world could be printed upon those unassuming pieces of paper 
that had the power to reduce grown men and women to silent statues. Secrets, their darkest secrets, sins beneath the surface, misdeeds buried so deep that the originators themselves had all but forgotten them. But the stranger, that peculiar shadow man, he knew, he knew everything. In stringing those terrible sentences together, he'd somehow felt the pain and guilt associated with those suppressed memories. Bewilderingly, he had been able to articulate, through the use of mere words, the gravity of those secrets. He implored each of them to reflect and repent, to take responsibility for those misdeeds, or he'd be forced to return to restore the balance. The high strangeness in the village of Rillington had a grand purpose. Each of the letters, handwritten in a strange, cursive, eerily reminiscent of an inexplicably familiar syntax, terminated with the same threat. Address. Confess. Do not repress. And upon reading those dreadful words, each of the villagers in the Mount Pleasant Inn pictured a face in their mind's eye, the face of their sins made flesh. It was an ugly face, a terrible face, though they'd be damned if they could describe a single aspect of it. Gazing upon it, it offered little comfort. They knew it was a warning, an opportunity to reflect, to learn, to change. And change they would, for that horrible face that scowled at them was the face of the stranger tasked to return for them, if the words of the shadow man went unheeded. It was a sobering thought. Ian was the first to snap out of the reverie, and stuffing the letter into his breast pocket, he rang the bell for last orders. The other occupants of the Mount Pleasant Inn followed in kind, each of them pushing thoughts of the grey man, the letters, and the notion of repentance to the backs of their minds, if only for the remainder of the evening. Twelve. The Boy in the Yard The strangeness that began in Rillington with a wish had to end with the granting of that wish, and the wish was indecent. How very unfortunate for Nigel Carroll's excitable sibling, Philip. The tapping sounded at Nigel's window just after eleven. Drawing back the curtains, he came face to face with the shooting star itself, the black-eyed girl with the Play-Doh face. Ever the broken record, the strange creature asked. Can I come in? The willing nine-year-old opened the window, and the misshapen child scuttled into the room. Its long, elasticated legs drew up behind it, growing shorter, an attempt to match the shape and form of its host. The boy trembled, gazing upon strange wonders in its black orbs. Spectres danced in the abysmal depths, each of which wore a familiar face. Abby Locurto? Old Pikey? Mr. Roberts? Dale Cameron? Then it spoke. Your wish is granted, it mumbled through lips that barely moved. Still shaking, Nigel simply watched as the thing slowly retreated, crawling in reverse, its limbs growing shorter still as the colour ran out of its rubbery face. It was gone. Rillington had already forgotten it, though the repercussions of its visit would last for generations, and young Nigel Carroll would be among the first to reflect upon those repercussions. He shivered, and somehow felt his little brother was no longer with them. Nervously, he left the comfort of his bedroom, and quietly descended the stairs. His father, Stephen, was at the Mount Pleasant Inn, whilst his mother, Susan, having consumed one drink too many, was snoozing on the couch in the living room. Where was Philip? He entered the living room proper, and glanced in the direction of the fireplace. The Christmas tree, which early that evening had been in the dining room, was standing next to it, free of tinsel, lights, and baubles. Had his mother moved it? If so, why hadn't she redecorated it? And it looked much smaller than it was before. He crossed the living room, and stepped into the dining room. Oddly, the nine-year-old was confused to discover that the Christmas tree hadn't moved at all. There it stood, the centerpiece of the bay window, illuminated, wrapped in a generous amount of tinsel 
and adorned with colourful baubles. Had his parents purchased a second tree? And where was Philip? As the youngster returned to the living room to contemplate the bare tree next to the fireplace, Stephen Carroll stumbled through the side door, a little worse for wear. His grand entrance woke his wife, who in turn slowly sat up and laid her eyes upon her wavering husband. Greeting each other with slurred pleasantries, Stephen caught sight of the bare Christmas tree by the fireplace. "'Where did that come from?' he asked. Susan followed his gaze. "'I've no idea,' she returned, stifling a yawn. Nigel observed the exchange from the corner of the room. An overwhelming sense of remorse washed over him. Where was Philip? Had he really made such a terrible wish? Had it come true? Was Philip hiding? Nigel trotted from room to room. The kitchen, the pantry, the conservatory, the study, the bathroom, the snug, mum and dad's bedroom, and of course Philip's room. But to no avail. His little brother wasn't at home. Back in the living room, Stephen and Susan's confusion regarding the bare pine had resulted in a bitter argument. Each stood accusing the other of acquiring it without the other's permission, each angrily insinuating frivolity and carelessness. In his anger, Nigel's father clutched the tree, lifted it above his head, and threw it across the room. He opened the side door, grasped the tree again, and tossed it onto the cold stone slabs outside. Nigel watched from the stairs in horror. But he hadn't been disturbed by the raised voices, or the foul language, no. He'd heard something much more troubling, and it chilled him to the core. As his father had clutched the small, plain pine, the nine-year-old had heard the faintest of sounds, a guttural whimper. Then, following its flight across the living room, Nigel had heard another sound, as the tree hit the wall, a muted grunt. And lastly, as the unwanted tree had hit the cold ground outside, the sprinkling of pine needles had muffled a shrill cry, an agonized squeal, issuing from its shriveled trunk. It was a child's voice, a familiar voice. No, it couldn't be. But it was Christmas Eve, and Nigel had wished upon a shooting star. His wish had been an invitation, and to his window it had come and it had wandered from door to door, window to window, studying the traditions of the season, the colourful wreaths, the lights in the village centre, and the trees everywhere, on every corner and in every home. The strange monstrosity from the heavens had turned Nigel's little brother into a humble Christmas tree. And he had been discarded, thrown out into the frosty night, to sit and contemplate his horrifying fate in isolation, never to know his own brother was responsible for such an end. But would there be an end for the boy in the yard? In time there would, but first, he'd have to endure the seasons. Discarded trees in the British suburbs had been known to survive for years in cobbled yards, dilapidated sheds, and abandoned outbuildings. It was all too much for Nigel. In his desperation, he ran into the dining room, and like a child possessed, he flung himself at the tree in the bay window. He tore the tinsel from it, and pulled at its limbs. He clawed at the vivid lights, and stamped upon the baubles. Nigel's intoxicated parents, distracted by the cacophony, came rushing to his side. But it was too late. Their beautiful tree had been destroyed. "'Why in the world came over you, Nigel?' Susan yelled, stumbling back and forth. Nigel stated, with the fervour only a bewitched child can muster, that the tree was bad, very bad, and that they were to get rid of it immediately, and replace it with the one in the yard. Susan gawped at her son. She didn't think she'd ever seen him so upset in all his life. And so, dutifully, his anger subsiding, Stephen Carroll collected what was left of the slaughtered tree, and placed it in the yard outside. In he brought the small, plain pine and positioned it once again by the fireplace. Philip was home. He was a Christmas tree, but at least he was indoors. Nigel ascended the stairs, and returned to his bedroom, gazing up at the crystal-clear night sky, his eyes feverishly tracing the glittering dots, searching frantically for a shooting star, just one, before the clock struck twelve.
He desperately wanted to retract the wish. It didn't matter that Philip was the favorite, he just wanted his little brother back. The clock was ticking. In the dining room, Stephen and Susan were doing their best to clean up the mess Nigel had made. At the very least, their son's outburst had served to sober them up. And it was in a moment of clarity that Susan proffered the most pertinent of questions. Where's Philip? 